deepened. Mao's first concern was still China's economy. Industrial output had doubled in five years, but he was not satisfied. Mao Zedong always hoped to build a socialist economy in China faster than the Soviet Union. He always thought fighting the Revolutionary War was very difficult. There must be a way to speed up agricultural or industrial production. Could it be more difficult than fighting a war? In 1958, Mao launched his most ambitious campaign to date, the Great Leap Forward. His goal was to make China the industrial equal of Western nations in just 15 years. His method was to mobilize the entire country to work day and night by promising a better future. We built reservoirs, planted cotton, cultivated trees and things like that. When we worked, we had a slogan, catch the stars and moon. We had to work when the stars and moon were out. We had breakfast very early and came home very late. So we worked all day long. We were so enthusiastic. To make work exciting, flags flew high in the fields and loudspeakers squealed. People shouted slogans one after another. Mao decided to visit some villages to see what was going on. I went with him. Once we came to a village and saw a banner with these words on it. People's communes are good. He read the words, people's communes are good. A reporter happened to be next to Mao and took down his words. The next day, the words appeared in the newspapers. That's how people's communes started. Mao's word was so powerful that almost overnight, people's communes sprang up across China. A commune encompassed many villages with thousands of families. Each day was strictly regimented and family life was virtually abolished. Children were placed in communal nurseries while their parents worked around the clock. People ate in the fields or in communal dining halls. To increase industrial output, communes were ordered to make steel. The slogan was to overtake England and catch up with America. The idea was that if everybody worked hard and everywhere in the country people refined steel, then we would catch up very soon. People collected walks, pots, bed frames and tools, anything made of iron or steel. They built small furnaces to melt them. The biggest challenge was to keep the furnaces fueled. We burned tables, chairs, window frames. And finally, we even opened old coffins and used the wood. They really stank. We kept the fires burning day and night. And for convenience, we built work sheds close to the furnaces. One day I worked very late and I was totally exhausted. We had separate sheds for men and women. But I was so tired I couldn't tell the difference. I just walked into a shed, lay down and fell asleep. When I woke the next morning, I found I was in the men's shed. Of course it was all right, nobody cared. 
All we cared about was making as much steel as we could. At night, you could see many furnaces along the railroad. Fire shot out of the furnaces. This made people excited. China was going through a great change. China was becoming a very rich and strong country. All this seemed to have happened overnight. Mao was very pleased. But the steel people made was useless. We used it to make pots of all sizes. But when people heated them, they cracked and leaked. If only we had the equipment to make good steel, but we didn't. We only had people. Our methods were very primitive. Of course we didn't make good steel. People were unhappy, but nobody dared say anything. The result was that everything made of iron and steel was taken from every family and was made useless. We had no tools left to use. While the government called on everyone to make steel, they also wanted to increase farm output. How could we increase the grain harvest? People said that if you did close planting and used more fertilizer, you would definitely increase output. People got carried away. They were hot-headed. From Mao Zedong and the Central Party Committee down to leaders at all levels, everyone was full of enthusiasm. During the Great Leap Forward, we believed miracles could happen. There was a saying, the corn will grow higher the more you desire. Communes and schools reported their wonderful news to the party. If one commune said they could turn out 150 tons an acre, another one would say their target was 180 tons. Each commune or school would promise a higher amount until the last school gave their highest figure. Our school set the target of 470 tons an acre. We dug a hole, something like a swimming pool. We thought if we put all the fertilizer in it, we would achieve our target. Then we poured the seeds in, which built up into a layer about this thick. There was a photograph in the People's Daily that showed the wheat in the field supporting the weight of children. Some leaders of the Central Party Committee were so happy that they put this photo on their desks at work. Most people believed it. We were surprised to see that photo and wondered how it could be possible. But because we were city people, we couldn't be sure it was a fake. When I went with Mao to the villages, I really did see so much grain in the fields, so much rice. The yields were so high. At the time, I thought everything was true. After the anti-rightist campaign, few dared to ask questions. Only one teacher spoke out. How thick would the wheat be if we did produce 470 tons? Immediately, he was accused of being a rightist and not believing in the party. Later, I learned it was all fake. The peasants were putting on a show for us. They moved grain from other places and put it all in one field. It was all a show for Mao.